Half awake, I change out of my pajamas. My parents are up already. I can hear them shuffle around the kitchen downstairs. My sister is still in bed, her arm covering her eyes, trying to rest as long as she can before getting up. We're doing a day trip to Sacramento, about a two hour car drive away. I make my way to the kitchen. My dad is seated in his usual spot at the dining table. He has his mug of instant coffee with sugar and the classic powdered creamer. Next to his coffee is a sandwich, butter, bologna, which he calls ham, and avocado, a new addition. When I was younger, his sandwich would only have bologna and butter. When I say butter, I'm talking about the little yellow tub of margarine product. My dad is the only person that I know that eats practically the same thing for breakfast every day of the week. I suspect this food choice might relate to when he used to live in Vietnam. It's his take on a banh mi and cafe suda, Vietnamese coffee, which was typical for breakfast. I immediately greet my parents, Jo Sun, good morning. They say it back to me, immediately after my mom asks if my sister is awake. I give a shrug. My mom says that I should eat something for breakfast. For me, it's too early to eat. I decline and tell her I have to save room in my stomach for later. My sister finally makes it to the kitchen as our parents are finishing their breakfast. My mom also tells my sister she should eat. She contemplates it for a moment, but also decides to skip eating this morning. We load up the car and are on our way. As we pass the state line into California, we can see evergreen pine forests and shrubs spread across the sheets of hard rock. Some snow is still dusted along the higher elevations of the Sierra Nevada. We get a glimpse of Donner Lake, glimmering on our left as the vehicles on the freeway accelerate to climb the incline in the road. We watch as the world outside changes from tan, rugged mountains to rolling, rounded hills in lush green. Even the smell changes. The smallest amount of moisture in the air can be felt on our high desert skin. Two and a half hours go by before we arrive in the little Saigon area. We pass by small shops and grocery markets with Chinese characters with words written in Vietnamese. My ears are a bit plugged and sore from all the elevation change. I try to yawn to pop them. As we pull up to a dim sum restaurant, the excitement of anticipation and hunger reaches its peak. It might be because I skipped breakfast or because we see family members gathering, but either way, we're here. Christina Cho, award-winning author of Mooncakes and Milk Bread, has had similar trips where she and her family create a special moment of traveling for food. It's part of why she developed a passion for cooking. To her, food was always more than about the taste. It was about sharing herself. Food is a way for me to share my personality. It's a way for people to kind of get to know me and understand me more. And I think that's why I love cooking so much. I think I spent a lot of my life feeling like I needed to like kind of hide parts of myself to kind of shy away from it. In the family restaurant her grandparents owned and operated and her mother's kitchen is where she cultivated her deep love of food and feeding the people in her life. Christina's blog, Icho Food, is her creative outlet to share thoughtful recipes, candid stories, and beautiful food photography. And she shares a bit more about herself in our conversation. Welcome, Christina. Could you tell me a bit about your background? Yeah, my my background uh, is a little took a lot of different journeys. Um, so I present day, I am a cookbook author and recipe developer. Um, a few years ago, I was a full time architectural designer and interior designer. Um, I am originally from Cleveland, Ohio. That's where I was born and raised for like the first 22 years of my life. I now live in the Bay Area. And I grew up in a very food centric household. Uh, my grandparents owned Chinese American restaurants growing up, and my parents are very great, very great cooks. Awesome. Uh, do you have any siblings? I have a younger brother. Um, what was it kind of like for you growing up in Ohio? Because you grew up there for the vast majority of, I assume, your life so far. And um, how's, how has that kind of impacted, you know, 
your transition into the Bay Area? Yeah. So I grew up in the suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio, um, being one of a handful of other Asian American kids. And I think at the time, I wasn't like at the time, meaning like when I was like seven, eight years old, I wasn't like fully conscious (laughs) about um, maybe how difficult or even how uncomfortable it could be. Definitely at the time, I had a sense that I was different than everybody else. Um, And I've actually been doing a lot of kind of more just like self-reflection about that time as I've been writing my my second cookbook. Um, It's called Chinese Enough and it kind of reflects about that time. And as you said, transitioning into the Bay Area and how that reflects in my food. I think growing up in Ohio, it shaped me in both positive and maybe negative ways. I think maybe in the negative ways, I've always had this kind of consciousness of being like perceived. I always felt like I was the odd person out, you know, being in my elementary school, I was like one of two Asian kids in like my entire school, my entire elementary school at one point. And so there was this always sense of, I always felt like there was like this spotlight or just like attention to me because I was different ever than everyone else. I couldn't just like totally blend in. And so I spent a lot of my adolescence trying to in, in these like non-physical ways, you know, like trying to like assimilate in terms of like what like other kids were interested in, like pop culture or sports or just like whatever um, was popular at the time. But at the same time, my family had been living in Cleveland since the late 60s. And Cleveland actually has a very small Chinatown, essentially. Currently, it's called Asia Town, um, just to be a little bit more inclusive of of all different types of Asian communities out there. But there was a small, you know, Chinese community, specifically Canton people, just like my grandparents. And so I felt like when I was growing up, I was, I had this dichotomy of going back to the suburbs where I had to kind of like code switch a little bit. And, um, integrate more into this community. And then when I would go visit my grandparents' house or just spend time with like my more extended family, I was able to just kind of more comfortably embrace my culture and my identity. I I feel really thankful that we had a small Chinatown that had like a grocery store and we had like a dim sum restaurant that we would go to pretty frequently. Like I know I've spoken to other people, um, other Asian people who've grown up in like not San Francisco, not LA or New York City, like who grew up in non-big cities and they're like, we didn't even have a dim sum restaurant. We didn't even have a great grocery store. And so I feel really thankful that we at least had one. Um, And so I was able to kind of experience like parts of my culture in that way. But for most of my life, I felt like I was like kind of bouncing between two worlds. There wasn't like I didn't feel comfortable to just kind of like move through life balancing both, just like being Chinese and American in a way. And it took me a few years to realize that that was like a reality that I could experience. After a couple of years, I moved to the inner Richmond district of San Francisco, which is like, I think some people would consider it kind of like a secondary Chinatown, but there's tons of neighborhoods like that in San Francisco. It's, it's not like you're, quintessential Chinatown with like the art the gates and the ver- architectural vernacular and that make you think of like oh Chinese or Asian people live here it's just an everyday it's like just an average neighborhood in San Francisco where there's a high concentration of just like multi-generations of like Asian American people there's also like a little Russian community in there too but I realized that like every morning I would walk to the bus and I would walk by my main Asian grocery store, Chinese bakery, and I could hear Cantonese just like being spoken like on the streets just casually. And it was just like everyday life. And I was like, wow, it's like possible to just like be me and to like feel like there's parts of my culture that are represented on on everyday basis. It's not just like for special occasions. Yeah. So yeah. Um, did you feel a bit of a culture shock? I wouldn't describe it necessarily as a as a culture shock necessarily. I feel like it was a little bit more sneaky. The <laughs> the gradual nuances, I guess. I I lived in Beijing for a summer just for like an internship, and I would say that's probably more of my definition of like a culture shock. You know, of like going to a completely other country where I also look like a lot of people, but people didn't feel like I was like them. I think it's more just about like having access to like ingredients and stores and like food and just general diversity of people were the things that um, I just like gradually got accustomed to. 
I think that's really nice, though, that you were able to have that in Ohio, I guess in the sense that kind of made it less of a big thing. For me, I was born in Oakland, and my parents moved to Reno when I was about three, so I've been in Reno uh, most of my life. And, I mean, we have Asian grocers and things like that, but, like, the nearest dim sum place is Sacramento, so that's a two-hour drive. And, I mean, we would do it. I have family out there, but it's just one of those things where I'm like, I can't go every weekend if I wanted to. It's It felt like it was like a special event, right? Like, you were like, Mm -hmm. I'm on a road trip to experience food that, (laughs) that like, resonates with my parents or whatever. It's not, like, an everyday thing. And I think that is something that I still am kind of, like, even trying to like understand you know like whenever my parents come and visit and they're coming in a few weeks they and I take them out to like different restaurants they like forget they can't just like speak Cantonese to each other like Uh, because people understand yeah yeah, because people understand like it happened at like a restaurant that like wasn't an Asian restaurant my dad being like a typical Asian dad um, was telling us and like my mom how like oh this place was expensive or like <laughs> or how this place is so expensive compared to the restaurant I went to the night before and then our waiter who my dad did not assume no Cantonese he was like oh yeah like I I totally get it you know like said something like that and my dad was like in horror he like could not believe that and so he he they are even trying to understand that like whenever they come here they're like oh like lots of people understand culture understand language everything you know it's like not like there's not so much like a strict difference between the areas you're going to um, that you have to change yourself for. So your blog, Icho Food, where did the idea for the blog come from? So I actually had the idea for some sort of like food website, maybe in like 2012. I remember I was like interning somewhere and it was when I didn't have like a lot of work to do as a typical intern. I was just like, I need to do something else. And at the time, I was, like, obsessed with reading other food blogs, um, just, like, general food media. I just, like, loved reading about it. And, yeah, I came up with the name Ichiro Food at that point. But it wasn't until a few years later that I actually bought the domain. And I finally felt the inspiration to actually create it and work on it actually develop recipes not just like make it um sometime in 2016 I believe and that was kind of like the peak of my general maybe frustration or lack of inspiration in my career which was working in architecture and interior design um I really loved studying it in school but actually practicing it out in the real world just like did not feel like it was it for me I think my first recipe on it ever were these like black sesame cupcakes of like matcha frosting, which <laughs> delicious. And also like, it feels like a time capsule. Like that feels so like 2017 <laughs> for me. I don't know why. Um, but it, it was the first time that I was like ever so consistent about doing something. Like I was very timely once a week, full recipe with photos and like a little narrative to go along with it. And I just like looked forward to it. I realized at work I was kind of generating recipe ideas when I should be like drawing or something, (laughs) (laughs) coordinating uh, emails with like engineers or something. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it got started. How do you develop your recipes? Um, my recipes develop in like the most random ways sometimes. Like I have this notes app on my phone that has been going on for years <laughs> and it's like so long and sometimes the recipe titles don't really make sense like sometimes I'll be like pink crystal dumpling with like shrimp or some like shape like descriptors like it's not like a full-on recipe it's just like notes to help conjure up the image that I had at the moment that I thought it up you know instead of drawing it um and so I sometimes just get like really random recipe ideas that just come to me while I'm like walking while I'm eating at a restaurant while I'm grocery shopping maybe I see someone else's food I'm like oh that reminds me of like a dish that like reminds me of my mom's and like I want to make like a version that's kind of like a hybrid of all that stuff and so that's kind of how like the idea ideas are generated then I go into the kitchen I buy ingredients and I test it I think that's really fun way to kind of think about recipes though right because like I think with your background it's also like a visual element you're trying to figure out 
can I make this in a shape that I haven't done before? Because I'm a graphic designer, so uh, kind of like the same thing where I'm like, oh, how do I make this pretty? But like functionally, this is still food. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, it's funny. We're, I feel like we're like actually very similar <laughs> in that respect too. <laughs> like I think when you come from like a creative discipline, you can just like visualize things, at least vaguely without knowing all the specific details of it. You know, like I can like... I had this recipe idea for this tom yum focaccia and I just like visually had it in my head. I'm like, it just like, it looks like a typical like tomato sauce type of like bread, you know, like it visually looks like really classic Italian bread. But then like the sauce is like where the details change, you know? Um, And I feel like that's like kind of how I approach a lot of recipes that way. I almost start visually and then like go into the details. So how do you... um And this is taken off your website, but how do you blend Chinese food, your Californian ingredients and kind of your Midwestern sensibilities into what you're creating? Yeah, Um, I think I, I feel like living in California, like I can't and especially in like the Bay Area, I feel like I can't help but like pay attention to seasonality. When is like the best time to eat your food? And like there's moment in time where recipes taste really good, you know, depending on like what is available, how you feel in the summertime, how you feel in the fall. I feel like I've always been like a little bit in tune to that, but definitely in the Bay Area and like going to the grocery stores, like you just naturally start to shop and start to cook that way. And I think also in the Bay Area, you start to kind of like develop this like value and like where your food is coming from, you know, not that it has to come from like the fanciest re- farm or ranch or whatever but like I at least care you don't have a cow in you know the back of your house (laughs) yeah but like I I I love to like grow my own vegetables and stuff but like there at least is that like that's that California influence in me is that I really care about where my food is coming from but I also feel that way tied to like when I think more about how my food is inspired by my like Cantonese roots Um, whenever I go to Hong Kong I'm always reminded of like how fresh and also seasonal The food is there, you know, like I think a lot of people in like Western or American media think of Chinese food and also think of Cantonese food as like Panda Express, you know, as like Chinese American food, which is its whole own subculture, which is like valid and true. But when I think of Cantonese food, I think of like the food that my grandparents would make, like so many fresh vegetables. My grandma grew, had a huge garden in urban Cleveland that she would grow like bitter melons, winter melons, yard beans, and stuff like that. And I feel that connection between Cantonese and Chinese values and like your ingredients and how it relates to Californian food. And then how the Midwest comes into play, like I spent so much of my life, still the majority of my life now, um, in Ohio. And I think that it gave me just like a sense of practicality I think kind of keeps me rooted there and not fall maybe too Californian in that way. I don't know how to explain it, but like, I think there's a sense of practicality and also frugality growing up in the Midwest, not being wasteful. And I also think like a sense of community. I spoke earlier about how I felt personally kind of always on the outside or Um, different than everybody else and that led to me kind of just like feeling uncomfortable a lot of times but I also reflect back about how many people were so kind to me my my friends parents and things like that and like I still have friends there now Um, like some of the nicest warmest people that I'll ever have in my life are from Ohio and I think there's that community spirit that was really developed from my time there and I think I carry that to like my kitchen and my dining table now in California Um, So that's kind of how all those elements of my life sort of intersect together. When you were kind of mentioning moving to the Bay that you felt like you blended in, but you're also putting yourself out there with your cookbooks that um, you've made. So why put yourself out there? Good question. (laughs) I think I, I think food just felt like a really safe and natural way for me to put myself out there and to share elements of who I am as a person. It's food as a way for me to share my personality. It's a way for people to kind of get to know me and understand me more. And I think that's why I love cooking so much. I think I spent a lot of my life feeling like I needed to like kind of hide parts of myself to kind of shy away from it. Um, But as I've, I've gotten older and like, 
created my own community of people. Like I love having friends and new friends, just like I'm always open to having anyone come over for dinner. And I feel like there is a way for people to kind of get to know me just like through the plate of food that I've like presented to them. It's never been super easy for me to make friends, but like the friends that I do make like often revolve around like some element of food cooking together or like a, a shared mutual love of eating or a special meal. So Yeah, I that's how I feel for a, a lot of things because people are always hungry and making food for people is very personal and it's one of those love languages where it's like act of service, you know, you're creating something that you want to share with people that you care about. And then that's how you show it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you blended a bunch of different cultures and ideas and backgrounds into food. Has that shown up in other areas of your life outside of food? I think maybe in terms of like, I think I can help it because I studied architecture and my, my husband is also a residential architect. And so I feel like I I can see those cultural influences like reflected in maybe like our home. Like my husband designed our kitchen. And um, I think the way that our home is reflected, you kind of see like different elements of our like California design. Like we live in like a old Cal, like hundred year old California bungalow craftsman style. But then there it's, it ties into like the historic architecture of the rest of the house, but then our kitchen is like a little bit like fresher and newer with like, I think Asian elements. Like I think, I don't know why there's like maybe, maybe the way that it's like styled with like plants and like that remind me of my grandma where there's like jars of like dried shiitake mushrooms on our shelves and stuff. And I have an old rip away Chinese calendars that um, I forget to do every month. So I have to like tear off like huge chunks of pages. Those are my favorite though. They're like so classic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And in a physical way, like I feel like our home kind of represents all those things. So you have a book out and then you're working on a new book. So the one that you have out, Mooncakes and Milk Bread, I, I feel like a lot of people don't commonly know unless you're within the culture that there are baked items in Chinese culture. Can you talk a little bit more about the book? Yeah. The Mooncakes and Milk Bread came out in the fall of 2021, my very first cookbook. And it was also the very first book that covered specifically Chinese baking in like a Western sense or like that that was like published in like America and really allowed for the book to kind of like reach a wide audience, you know, of one people who grew up eating different buns and going to Chinese bakeries um, growing up, and then to another community of people who had no idea that this existed, you know? And so it was, like, really special for me to kind of dive into these recipes that were kind of, like, foundational to my childhood. Growing up in Cleveland, like, every year or so, my family would road trip to Chicago, which, other than Toronto... Um, Chicago was like our closest like big Chinatown that had more than like one of each thing <laughs> you know like in, in Cleveland we had one grocery store one dim sum dim sum hall and like no bakery so we would go to Chicago and like our first and last stop during our multi-day trip was always a Chinese bakery you know we would stop there to load up for the week and then we would stop there before we would go home so that we could bring them home for us and like put them in the fridge or freezer to keep for a little bit longer so I have a lot of memories at Chinese bakeries grabbing hot dog buns, bolo bao, egg tarts, you know, like, and, and yeah, even going to dim sum, like there's so many like things like egg tarts or malai cake that like show up outside of a normal bakery context, you know, so that food is like everywhere. So yeah, it was really special for me to kind of develop that. And I think it resonated with a lot of people who never really got to see their food represented like that in, in like an actual book. And to also kind of feel that pride of seeing like other people like this recipe too. Well, I think it's also great to have a collective recipe book for those type of things because I feel like people around our age usually tend to get recipes from our parents that are like, oh, just slap these things in here with ambiguous measurements and we're left to figure it out. And a lot of it's trial and error, but it's it's nice to have something to follow and one of yeah. my favorite dim sum dishes is a uh, turnip cake or lobako. And yeah. I 
had my mom try to teach me quite a few times. But I'm like, I need what? I need dried shrimp and, mm-hmm. you know, like Chinese sausage and a bunch of other ingredients. I'm like, I don't even know if we have these in the market here. Yeah, I I feel like it's it's always a struggle that a lot of people share trying to get recipes out of your parents. You know, I think that now that I've been kind of doing my work as a recipe writer for a couple of years, my mom has started to like occasionally take some notes about like how many teaspoons of like white pepper she'll put in here, <laughs> like whatever. She'll like try to think a little bit more critically about like what everything is going in there, but it's still, yeah, so hard to get like exact measurements from anybody in my family. So what kind of feedback have you gotten about the blog and the cookbook? I think with my website and with my book, I think like the kind of like the biggest takeaway is just like, thank you for showing me how to make this dish that has like eluded me for so long. Whether or not it's like related to something like their mother or father or grandparents made a long time ago or something that reminded them of like a moment while traveling like a long time ago. I think that people see my recipes as like a really good source of just learning. You know, like I think for me, one of the things I love most about like writing recipes is just teaching people and also make people feel something, whether or not that's comfort or nostalgia or just general fullness. <laughs> so um, tell me more about your new book. What What's it called and um, what are you kind of hoping uh, would be the kind of feedback you would get from this one? Uh, so my next book is called Chinese Enough and it is a little bit of a departure from Mooncakes and Milk Bread that was very single subject, but I still was able to kind of like insert a little bit more like personal elements to the recipes to kind of give them a little bit more humanity you know not just saying like this is a cookie that you find at a bakery this is a cookie that like my grandpa made in his first kitchen job you know like back in the day when people when Chinese restaurants were actually baking and I really love being able to kind of share those like personal stories behind like food and I think that was also another reason why people really enjoyed the book getting the feedback from Mooncakes and Milk right kind of gave me the courage to write Chinese Enough you know, I'm oh, people care about my stories in addition to the food and, and, and like the kind of just like skill set knowledge, you know, like they care more beyond the recipe, you know. So it gave me um, the courage to write Chinese enough and kind of share a little bit more about my journey of finding confidence as like a Chinese American person. It's still something I'm like definitely navigating now and will probably continue to navigate my entire life but I I came up with the name kind of at the 11th hour when I was writing my manuscript and I was working on the narrative essays that I wanted to kind of sprinkle throughout the book and I was writing the intro and I was writing about how for a lot of my life I never felt Chinese enough um, and explaining how that feeling has nothing to do with your ancestry, your DNA results, you know, <laughs> like I did that test, I'm hundred percent Chinese, but yet I still don't feel Chinese enough, at least in America. And at some points I've also never felt American enough either. And that led to kind of a lot of, I don't know, struggles and like general feeling of being uncomfortable, um, for a lot of my life until I really got into cooking and it like was a way for me to kind of like find confidence and it was a way for me to kind of show who I am. I think people consider me first generation Chinese American, but my mom moved to the United States when she was six years old. So I sometimes consider myself like a one and a half or something, but like the recipes that I have of my mom's are already kind of showing off this like hybridization of like Chinese in American, like one recipe that's in there that's called mom spaghetti and it's spaghetti noodles but the sauce is like ground beef a lot of white pepper oyster sauce and ketchup like that is the main that's the sauce there's no like tomato sauce in it other than like like whatever byproduct and ketchup is but it's like so good and like so foundational to my childhood and uh when I talk about it to other people they're like oh that reminds me of like Filipino spaghetti or like Japanese spaghetti you know which is again like that hybridization of like taking your either Filipino or Japanese culture and like using ingredients that you had access to that are like maybe more American, you know? 
So there's recipes like that that like preserve the people in my life. Um, but then there's also like food that maybe combines a little bit more of like my California aesthetic using fresher ingredients, just kind of showing off like maybe like a modern view of like how Chinese cooking can appear now. Um, and I think that's really important to see that Chinese American food, Asian American food doesn't all have to look the same. So how would you say that your overall sense of what it means to be Chinese American um, is to you? I think for me to be Chinese American is allowing myself space and freedom to kind of hold the things that my mom and past generations have instilled in, the, in me while also allowing myself to come through every single day. That feeling is something I haven't really been able to feel until like most recently. Like I felt like I was kind of like wavering between what all these other outside people were telling me that I should be as a Chinese American person. I think to be Chinese American is very self-described, you know, really individualized. And I think it's really all about finding that confidence. That was my conversation with Christina Cho, cookbook author and recipe developer from Cleveland, Ohio. You can find out more about her recipes and cookbooks at ichofood.com. That's E-A-T-C-H-O-F-O-O-D dot com. For more information on this episode and the series, head to pbsreno.org slash Refugee's Daughter. And a special thank you to Christina for joining the show. Subscribe to Refugee's Daughter wherever you listen to podcasts and give the show a rating and review. I'm Christina Lee, and thanks for listening. This episode was written by Christina Lee with production help from Divergent Point Media. Refugee's Daughter is a presentation of PBS Reno.